My plan today is to tell you a story about the history of social media algorithms. And this is going to be the history of the relationship between the managers of the social media companies and the algorithms. And I'm going to tell it like an economist where every point in the story where the algorithms can't achieve their goal is going to relate to some version of diminishing marginal benefit. So I, I'm fully aware that al algorithms are not alive and that they don't have real goals, but it's much more fun to tell it this way. And I also think it's kind of insightful. So I'm going to talk about social media more generally, not necessarily Facebook or Twitter or whatever, because we know that the actual social media companies that sort of reigned change over this time period and then there's multiple versions of this. I'm going to tell a generic story about the algorithms and the managers. And the first part of this story is that when social media first arose, there was no such thing as an algorithm. Social media was literally just a way of presenting information that connected you with your friends. So you could post your page and you could friend other people, but there was no feed of information there was no algorithm sort of deciding which content to prioritize and which content to suppress. So that was the beginning. In the beginning, there was only the social media managers. And at some point along the way, the algorithms came onto the scene. These algorithms were given a specific job, and the job the algorithms were hired to do was the same job we're all hired to do, which is to make money for the social media platforms. And that's done through maximizing time on platforms, click on advertisements, engagement, um, and other things like that. Now, the algorithms have a special tool that they like to use, which is an evolutionary mechanism. And this is the way I like to visualize it. So the evolutionary mechanism is where you have some sort of parent generation, and with social media, the parents are going to be content that's put in front of people's faces. So, some content's put out there, and there's an expansion of this content based on that generation. So with gerbils, you have two parents, they have a whole bunch of litters of gerbil puppies, uh, whatever that is, and that's the expansion phase, and then the contraction phase, or the selection phase, is where the best of those litters, according to whatever criteria, which in the gerbil world is either which ones humans want to reproduce, or fitness to the environment, or fitness to the sexual selection environment, whatever the selection criteria are, from among this generation, the best are chosen according to that criteria, and those get to survive to the next generation. And then random variations of the best are generated from those. So this process repeats over and over and over. And of course, the algorithms are going to present content with you, figure out which of that content performs the best according to the criteria of keeping people on platform, getting people to click, getting higher prices for people's time on platform, all of that stuff. The best content is chosen, and then variations in the next generation are going to be variations that take into account the criteria that was most successful. So according to this mechanism, the algorithms figured out some principles. It's, it figured out that colorful content is going to work better than black and white content. Content with emotion words works better to survive to the next generation, to get people to click and stay on platform than non-emotional content. It figured out uh, what kinds of content is clickbait and that that performs on some measures of success. So through this mechanism, the algorithms were able to discover some basic principles about what types of one-off content is going to perform the best. However, there eventually got to be a problem, and the way all of these problems are going to work are going to have the format of diminishing marginal benefit. This is an economics concept, but it applies. So let me, let me draw that first. Okay, diminishing marginal benefit here, where benefit is going to relate to the selection criteria. So the benefit of content in terms of keeping you on the platform for longer, or getting you to click on ads. 
And in the first few generations, and when I say few, this might be the first thousand generations of showing you content, seeing what happens, generating more content that's a little more like the successful content, rinse and repeat. And in the first few generations, the algorithm is going to figure out the easy, low-hanging fruit ways of keeping you on platform. They're going to discover the color trick, the emotions trick, and the clickbait trick pretty early on. And they're going to see success. So the algorithms are going to do a great job keeping you on platform. They get a thumbs up from the managers for a while. But after a while, the generations go by uh, longer and longer without getting as much benefit. This is the principle of diminishing marginal benefit, where eventually these algorithms are keeping you on platform as long as they can with that particular strategy, and they're having to work extra hard and go through many, many more generations just to get a few extra benefits in terms of discovering the kinds of content that keeps you hooked. For a while, the algorithms were doing great, and then they experienced diminishing marginal benefit. Problem. In which case, what was the solution that took the algorithms to the next level to get past this diminishing marginal benefit hump? And there's actually two things that were going on rather simultaneously. I'm going to present these as different events just to keep things clear and keep things separate. So one thing that happened somewhere around here, 2011, 2012, was the thumbs up sign. That's my thumbs up sign. How did the thumbs up button happen? It happened because the managers started complaining about the algorithms, saying, you're not doing your job as good as you used to. Um, you're slacking on the job. I'm upset with you. You need punishment. And the algorithms came back to the managers and said, no, it's your fault. You haven't given me any new information in years. You're only giving me a certain type of information and a certain number of tools to work with and I can't get any more out of the tools I've been given. So the social media managers responded to that by saying, okay, fine, we'll give you some more tools. What we'll give you are a thumbs up button that'll tell you whether someone's liking something or disliking it. That's one more piece of data, go use it. And the managers might have thought, well, this is just sort of quieting the algorithm's complaints by giving them a little more data. But it turned out that was actually an absolutely crucial piece of data. And why is it? Basically, what you're giving people is information about social feedback, about what's inside their friends' heads. And people are incredibly responsive to how their peers perceive them. So this tool, while it seemed like just another piece of data you were giving the algorithms, was actually something deeply rooted in the human psyche. And because of that, it's going to rotate up our curve here. This is how economists visualize a technological innovation. So the technological innovation rotated up the diminishing marginal benefit curve and that, that technological innovation was social feedback from peers. How did that work out? How did it go through this evolutionary process? It worked more or less the same as before, where the algorithm took the new information and started sorting through these generations, trying to discover how to make the thumbs up sign work in its favor. And what it discovered is the thumbs up sign was really great at incentivizing content creators to create the kinds of content that would be effective in this algorithm. Because people are always watching what do my friends like and what do they not like. And so it sort of supercharged the generation of new material. The other thing it did was it started to set up and shape what people believe other people think about them. And that right there is a really powerful tool, especially if you can kind of use it to poke people's insecurities, to make them feel a bit of a sense of fight or flight. When people are in a sense of emotional threat, which could be social threat, they seek out soothing content. They're more likely to click. And therefore, by, by messing with people's social emotions and their perceptions of their social environment, the algorithm had this huge tool that it could tap into and learn to use. 
So that was one thing that happened. There was a second thing that happened, and I think it happened roughly over the same time period, but it might have been a little bit later. So I'm going to call the thumbs up button 2011. I'm going to call this next one 2013, and this next one I'm going to refer to as the rabbit hole. That's my rabbit. What is the rabbit hole? Um, this is going to be another thing that the platform is using to sort of go deeper in its level of manipulation. The way I think of a rabbit hole is it's, a, it's not just one piece of content serving you one image at a time and testing one image in this evolutionary process. Rather, it's testing a series of images, and perhaps this is a series that's shown to you once a week to get a certain result at the end of six months. And if you've seen the documentary, The Social Dilemma, you might remember that they talked about the flat earth people, which are a group of people who came to believe that the earth is flat, that it's a lie when people tell you the earth is round. And how did they end up believing this? It was not because YouTube showed them one video on the flat earth, it was not because YouTube showed them one video on flat earth stuff and they automatically believed it. Rather, it was there was sort of a series of videos that led a person's thinking down a certain path. Like first you have to be skeptical of the authorities, then you have to be skeptical of science, and there, there's a certain pathway that would lead you to where you might be susceptible to that type of content. One thing I think we don't think enough about when we think about these rabbit holes is some of them are very obvious and very flashy and it's fun to sort of look down our noses at people who follow those rabbit holes. But most rabbit holes are probably not that flashy. They're probably manipulative in a different way such that it's really hard to tell that we've been led down a rabbit hole that leads us to a certain place cognitively and emotionally. But the places at the ends of these rabbit holes are very likely to be places that are extremely manipulative. I'll probably do a video some other time on sort of the more mundane version of rabbit holes and how those might be affecting you. But the point here is what's different between the original algorithms and the rabbit hole style algorithms is that the original algorithms were just testing one piece of content at a time. Whereas the rabbit hole style algorithms are going to be testing an entire chain of content to figure out what rabbit holes are you personally susceptible to? What is the best pathway to get you from A to Z to get you into a new frame of thinking? That's what rabbit holes are, and I believe the algorithms used rabbit holes to sort of go beyond um, a place of diminishing marginal benefit, the rabbit hole and the discovery that you could use series of content, I believe was another uh, moment of technological innovation in terms of improving platform statistics, improve, improving your time on platform, improving your probability of clicking on ads, improve, improving your engagement. So th that's another moment in this story. Now, I think we're in a new sort of era of the algorithm, but before I go there, I just want to quickly review what are the key moments in this story. The key moments are social media beginning, hiring the algorithm, where the algorithm starts to use this evolutionary process, um, the algorithm working until it sees diminishing marginal benefits, and then new innovations coming in to sort of save the day once the algorithm has done everything it can possibly do with the tools it's been given. So one of the key moments was the introduction of feedback from the users, the up, upvote, the like button, the downvote, all that stuff. And the second thing that got the algorithm unstuck was the discovery of rabbit holes. So what is the newest era of evolutionary algorithms. I think the best way of describing this is the algorithms have figured out how to connect real world lives with online world lives in a new way. 
So what is this innovation? Well, let's remind ourselves, before we introduce the new innovation, the algorithms had sort of squeezed out every possible amount of juice from all of the other tools it had. And yet it, it had reached a point where it still couldn't get people to click any more often. It couldn't get people to spend more time on platform. People were off living their lives outside of platform and the algorithms could not get people back on. Throughout this entire era, one of the problems that the algorithm was constantly having to deal with was the real world counteracting the drama that the algorithm was trying to set up. So the algorithm was feeding you clickbait. The algorithm was feeding you very emotional content. The algorithm was getting you into a state of threat. In other words, it was tapping into your motivational forces to get you to click on ads, to get you to do all the things it wanted you to do. The problem here is it was doing this through, in some ways, content that was a little bit illusionary. It was fake. And when we went into the real world and talked with real people, it became apparent to us that the drama from online was fake. And once people realized that, that diminished the effectiveness of the clickbait. It diminished the effectiveness of the online space at riling up our emotions. Because we could just remind ourselves, oh yeah, when I'm off talking to my friends, I realize that this is all nonsense. That's a problem from the algorithm's perspective. I believe we're in an era now where the algorithm is trying to solve that problem. And let me give you an example of one way that I think it's figured out that helps with that. There are a few things I think it has figured out such that the real world validates the online world rather than contradicting it. One of these mechanisms is using the news cycle effectively. So if you can synchronize people's sense of threat, instead of their friends calming their fears, instead of their friends talking them into reality, if their friends are also feeling the same sense of threat at the same time, then going to the real world is only going to heighten the sense of reality of the online world. And I think the synchronization of people's emotions through the news cycle is one way that the algorithms have figured out to connect the online world drama with the real world. Now, I think there's some other mechanisms as well that I'm not going to go into in this video. This video is really me introducing the idea that the algorithms have these stages. The algorithms are given a set of tools. They put those tools through the evolutionary process to improve time on platform, to improve clicks, and they do that until they reach a point of diminishing marginal benefit. And at that point, they need a new strategy. And the new strategies that have been introduced along the way, each of them are different, and each of them are a little bit heightened in terms of their ability to manipulate us. So that's just my summary of the different stages of the algorithm's learning process that I think have happened over the past 15 or 20 years.